Well, basically, though, I, I'm going to talk about effective young adults ministry, and, and what I really want to hit is some of the questions of where does young, uh, young adult ministry end, what on earth is going on, and I want to give you, I guess, sort of a, a broad cultural picture of where we're at. Um, I just want to give you a definition to begin with, um, which is I think young, effective young adults ministry is connecting young adults who find themselves coming of age. Oh, should I write this down? You're all right. Yeah. Uh, so ultimately, looking beyond programs, looking beyond bums on seas, looking on beyond any of that stuff, for me, ultimately what we're talking about here, whether you're dealing with a kid who's grown up in church, uh, a 39-year-old who thinks they're 22, uh, a 16-year-old who thinks they're 32, what are you talking about? Ultimately, what, what, what young, uh, effective young adult ministry is connecting young adults who find themselves living in a meaning, dehydrated culture with a biblical story. Now, what I want to do is... is is say that part of the problem with what's going on at the moment and what's sort of been emerging over the last 10 years, thank you, that's good, it's only a matter yeah, of time, probably kick that over, is that <coughs> sometime after World War II, uh, and probably probably in the 30s, 40s, but really kick off after World War II, is that we created the idea of the youth group. Before then, we had things like the Sunday School Movement. Uh, but after World War II, we created the idea of the youth group. And the youth group followed <coughs> from the emergence, particularly in American culture, but also in Aussie culture, of the teenager. After World War II, all of a sudden, you had young people have disposable income. They were staying in school longer. And you had this delayed moment between childhood and adulthood. And this created a whole bunch of things. This meant that how we relate uh, sexually changed. That all of a sudden, before that, you had debutante balls, uh, you had houses, if you look at some of these Victorian houses around here, they would have parlours where if you were going to meet someone of the opposite sex, you would bring them in and you'd meet. And it was this whole sort of culturally uh, structured way of meeting the opposite sex. All of a sudden you have um, a gap between childhood and adolescence where in the past you would meet someone at debutante ball, you would ask permission from their father to start writing to them or dating to them, often there'd be a chaperone, and then you'd meet, have sex, have kids, and we go from there, under, obviously marriage. What adolescents did is all in, in that order <laughs> most of the time. Uh, now, what happened was that you all of a sudden had teenagers who would borrow their parents' car. There was virtually no casual sex before the invention of the car because if you're living in uh, Adelaide in 1873, where are you going to have casual sex? With who? You don't know any girls. How do you, on earth do you do it? Now, it happened between servants and uh, uh, People of different classes of how casual sex happened. How's this turned into a casual sex talk? Anyway, uh, history of casual sex uh, coming online very soon. Um, and then also, and it's going to be a big. You have a casual sex talk. You give this to your kids. Um, and, um, so, so what happened was it changed how we view sexual ethics, but it would happen in that sort of a very short period between sort of 16, 17, and people were mostly married by 20. The other thing that it did was also all of a sudden you had kids who had worked part time and uh, youth culture is created with the advent of, of uh, money being in kids' pockets. You would not have had rock and roll, Elvis, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, everything that came forth if you did not have uh, these adolescents who had money in their pocket. They would have, you, know, you wouldn't have had rock and roll. Um, so what happens is, you know, we sort of then, you know, you have the Sunday School movement which is about 100 years old uh, and then all of a sudden you create the youth group. So we realise, and this was the golden age of Youth for Christ and, and all of this stuff that comes out of this period. We're like, what do we do with this emerging teenagers and have things like the navigators and, and people which connect with young adults at, at a sort of college level. So you sort of had youth and then there was this sort of college or university thing. So it was sort of children, which classic was Sunday school, um, which were run like the SS. Um, and um, then you sort of had teen, teens, which was the youth group. Now, most of what they did was trying to create some culturally relevant sort of grouping for, for teenagers. You know, this is the youth group. This was our pizzas, bowling alleys. Isn't it funny that actually the, the, the uh, activities of most youth groups are actually social activities that were popular in the 1950s? <laughs> bowling, did you? Um, mm -hmm. Ice skating. You know, so like there's these sort of dying centres in Melbourne like ice skating, which are only populated by Christian youth groups and roller rinks. Like no one else goes there, just kept going. So it's like the 50s continue. Uh, and then what you had is you had sort of uni ministry, and then basically what would happen at 22, 21, boom, you're an adult now, you've got kids, um, and it's adulthood. Now, what happens today is we still pretty much have this, 
institutionally stuck in our churches and in our imaginations. But what's happened is, since particularly the 1960s, is that our total model of adolescence <coughs> and how we live it as adults has completely changed. And uh, I'm not going to go back because it's the, if I had more time, I'd do the whole history of this from the 17th century onwards, but that just sounds really geeky. But um, ultimately, what you have today is that these, these uh, uh, sort of categories, if you like, have just blurred. So in the past, teens was 13, really teens was about 16 when kids would start dating, having their own lives. Now this is blurring. You know, you've got what you call the tweens in here. When does this begin? When does this end? You know, you've got, you know, Miley Cyrus, is she acting too raunchy? What, what is she? Is she a teen? Is she a young woman? Is she, what on earth is going on here? Where does this begin and end? And then what you've got down here, and I'm going to explain why this has happened in a second, is that this sort of teen to adulthood has just blurred completely. And so you've got churches which are set up with this very set structure, and you've got literally people who are 39 who act like young adults. You have guys who are in their 50s who have been doing the sort of responsible thing and then all of a sudden leave the wife and run up with the secretary to get the sports car and, and the tattoo and it's all, you know, happening. And you've also even got retirement is almost being recast as a chance to have a second youth. So part of the problem in our churches is you guys um, have this question that you've got, you know, sometimes youth who are acting in behaviours which are adult and then you've got adults which are acting in behaviours which are youth. And where does this begin and end? Particularly when you've got a church council or a senior pastor who is saying, well, this is the, the age group in which you deal with. But the culture's just completely thrown that model out of the window. Now, part of the reason that we've gotten here is because ultimately people are trying to find meaning in a culture which has completely dehydrated itself of meaning. Now, without doing the super history thing, I just want to do something really quick. Imagine you're Jesus and his family and you're a teenager and at night when it's hot as it is often in Israel and people sleep on the roof. Imagine you're lying there with your family, there's no TV and you've got your parents, brothers and sisters beside you and you all lay there and you watch the sun go down and you watch the stars and this is before light pollution so you can see everything and as a family you pick out the constellations. You remember the words of the Old Testament which said that, you know, the stars speak of the works of the Creator, that they speak the Word of God. And you think of the entire culture that Jesus lived in where everything contained a sense of meaning, that he lived in a universe where everything was meaning-filled. This worldview continues right up to the Middle Ages where everything that happened in culture, everything that happened in creation was something with the handiwork of God. So it, the problem with the world then was almost too much meaning. And if you go to places like Papua New Guinea, parts of Africa today, you know, just a, 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 a trip to the local river, you've got to go past this god, you've got to, uh, you know, take a talisman to protect you from this river sprite, whatever. That the problem is the world has too much meaning. And evangelism in those contexts is often what they call power evangelism. You go to Africa, what people in Africa are wanting in, in rural situations is a powerful god who can defeat the other gods, the other spiritual forces, and help them find a life that works in a, in a world where there's supernatural power, supernatural entities, too much meaning in the world. Now, I'm not going to go through it because I've got 20 minutes, but what happens, you have the enlightenment where science and reason comes in and basically deconstructs this meaning saturated world. And you have the emergence of the modern world. Where meaning is really only found in that which you can measure, that which you can use your five senses, taste, touch, feel, sense, smell, whatever. And, and science takes over and says, really what's important is only that which can be scientifically measurable. So what happens then is meaning is almost drenched out of the world. Drenched out of the world? Removed from the world somehow. And what we're told is that if we continue this process, humanity will get to this point where we've reached almost the kingdom of God on earth without God. And at the end of the 19th century, you had the World Congress on Religions, where they thought they were going to basically solve all the differences between the religions. You had um, people prophesying that all disease would 